Well, greetings, dear friends around the world. This is Alexander Sashavedis from East Europe, giving you the latest update on the conflict in Ukraine. Once again, I need to stress the fact that uh, my country, being in a country which is neutral in this in this conflict, which is a Slavic country as well, because both Ukrainians and Russians are Slavic people, being in a Slavic country, Serbia, I have a privilege to receive. Uh, both news from both sides, both Ukraine and Russia, and therefore I can present them to you uh, the way that they are presented to us here through the uh, Serbian National News Agency. It has been 77 days since the war in Ukraine began, 77 days of agony, 77 days of civilian casualties, terrible destructions and so on and so forth. 77 days of various tough sanctions imposed on Russia ever. And it has been another victory day the other day, which was on May the 9th, uh, on, on Monday. Another victory day in Russia celebrated as with the traditional victory day parade, military parade. What shall one say other than to just wonder when in the world is this going to end? Now, once again, I just want to caution you that, no, there will be no nuclear attack at this point. From what I know from the Bible, from the Holy Scriptures, to those of you who care about it, because this is the Bible History, Biblical History Channel, from what I know from the Bible, no, the nuclear attack is not yet to be done, not at this point in time. When that time comes close, I'll certainly be one of the first ones to warn you that that would be the case. But in the meantime... In the meantime, Russians have been targeting various military targets in Ukraine, which of course also does does sadly uh, en uh, enact or, or, or entail, better said, sadly it entails civilian casualties and casualties on the Ukrainian infrastructure. As you might have noticed in the news, the Russians have targeted the railways again, and various warehouses where the Russians claimed that those warehouses were full of uh, military uh, aid provided to Ukraine by the European Union, as well as by the United States of America. Speaking of the United States of America, I'm truly amazed at the actions of Joseph Biden and even the Congress. Uh, lately, uh, we heard that $40 billion have been, have been approved to be sent to Ukraine to finance their war. Now, is this really rational? Can anyone really say that the current United States president is ra a rational person? I mean, consider the fact that he, he acts like a Santa Claus. He acts like a Santa Claus to Ukraine because, you know, America itself has got enough problems. The southern border of America, border of America is breached and, 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 and being viola violated by all kinds of immigrants getting into the America. Uh, the American economy is not doing much better. There is a terrible inflation as well. But here he comes, you know, as a Santa Claus with $40 billion dollars. At first, it was there were rumors there would be about eight billion dollars, but all of a sudden, it's forty billion dollars given to Ukraine. Well, do you think that financing a proxy war can bring anything good on uh, the region of East Europe? Financing a proxy war may just uh, prolong this conflict in Ukraine, which you know would mean that the Russians will just continue to target all of those military aids coming from the West. And the war, this war can just go, can be just dragged on for, 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 for who knows how long. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say forever because it's certainly not going to be forever and ever, but one of these days has to stop. But I mean, this, uh, approval of Congress and this kind of Western help to Ukraine does not really do much good to anything. It will just cause, it will mean more casualties, more devastation, more civilians being killed, uh, more soldiers being killed on both sides, etc etc. From the last, one of my last, uh, in my last installment, I've told you that the uh, Russians have now concentrated their attacks basically on the two Russian populated areas, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, uh, popularly called Donbas, the both of them. So the basically east and south Ukraine is the, uh, is where the front is now going on where the frontal, uh, frontal uh, attacks and, and, and fights have been going on anyway. And uh, Russian forces, along with the ethnic Russians in the local areas, 
of Donetsk and Lugansk are basically trying to completely uh, clean and push out any Ukrainian central government forces out of those two areas. Uh, there's been reports about the severe uh, clashes around the city of Kharkov, the second largest city in Ukraine. Uh, Kharkov is also, well, populated, not uh, has a significant Russian population there as well. However, the Ukrainian side claims that they have uh, regained control over several areas around Kharkov. At the same time, from the city of Kherson and the Kherson area, the local authorities have reported that they have uh, they have uh, aspiration to join Russian Federation. Uh, of course, the response from Kremlin, which is the original re- Russian name for Kremlin, the response from Kremlin has been that it has to have a legal a legal background, which means that the residents of the uh, of the Kherson area would have to basically you know vote in a democratic way and basically express their will. Uh, the Ukrainian government <laughs> has really rejected this this kind of claim, and they say that only traitors could vote for something like that. However, there has been reports that the Kherson area authorities, local authorities, have requested to join the Russian Federation. Uh, the conflict continues in the city of Odessa. I told you in my last installment that indeed Odessa would be one of the military targets because the Russians now have very clearly stated that their goal is to cut off the access of the access of Ukraine to both the Azov Sea and the Black Sea. So uh, I guess by doing so they would just uh, make sure that there would be no uh, military aid from the West coming to Ukraine via the seas. And at the same time, again, they're also targeting the uh, railways, railway stations, which means that you know they're trying to prevent any Western aid coming to Ukraine uh, via the railway. Uh, there are estimations about the casualties on both sides. Ukrainians have have come up with uh, with uh, the figure of how many Russians were killed in the conflict. The Russians have not come up yet with any figures of that nature. So we don't really know because any side is uh, prone to a bit of exaggeration of their own victory successes. So therefore I'll just refrain from giving you any of such numbers because, but then nevertheless the numbers are terrible and staggering and, and sad. And how, no matter what the numbers are, uh, it, it is so sad, it just saddens me so much that I would rather not speak about the figures and statistics, I'm rather going to give you just an overview of what is going on. So right now, basically, the uh, area of Lugansk and Donetsk, Donetsk, the two areas are being the target of the Russian Russian forces, they're trying to expel completely the Ukrainian government forces. In the city of Mariupol, the city that you have quite often heard from me about in the last, in the last, how many, in the last uh, February, March, April, in the last three months, uh, the city of Mariupol is now completely under the Russian control, but however, there are some, the uh, remnants of the Azov battalion right there in the steel plant of uh, Azovstal in Mariupol. The humanitarian corridors were open for the civilians that were sheltered in the uh, in the steel steel plant or steel factory, and according to well, uh, according to Ukrainians, the Russians were obstructing the evacuation of the civilians. However, the uh, Russians claimed that they opened up the corridors, and the uh, latest deadline, the last day for the corridors to be open, was this last Saturday. Uh, however, the United Nations have confirmed that the Russians indeed opened the humanitarian corridors and the Russians now have reported that there are no civilians left uh, in shelters of the Azovstal of the steel plant. As soon as the civilians were evacuated, the Russians have launched all offensive uh, on the steel plant trying to eliminate the last remnants of the Azov battalion soldiers. Uh, some disturbing photos of wounded, uh, wounded Ukrainian, uh, soldiers who are part of the Azov battalion have surfaced. They are quite, well, disturbing and shocking, but again, the Russians have repeatedly called upon those 
soldiers to lay down their arms. They called them. They've sent them repeatedly called several for several, you know, for several, several times over the last three months to lay down their weapons and they would guarantee them fair treatment according to the international law. But the uh, Azov battalion soldiers refused basically and therefore they are now targeted by the Russian forces. One of those uh, Azov battalion men happened to become, uh, to be a volunteer fighter from Croatia. He was caught as he was trying to be, evac- he was trying to, to, to escape the steel plant, uh, pretending to be a civilian, but he was caught. And for the Russian authorities, he, uh, he stated that people could not even imagine what kind of Nazis are there in the steel plant. Well, dear friends, we can imagine what kind of Nazis are there because the uh, city of Mariupol, uh, and let me be clear, from the very start of this conflict, I've told you, the, uh, the, 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 the main culprits for this kind of devastation of the city of Mariupol are exactly the Azov battalion soldiers, the neo-Nazi formation. Uh, the neo-Nazi formation, which in the last, in the last eight to ten years, basically, fortified themselves within the city of Mariupol and were using the civilians as a shield. Uh, it was, I told you, I repeatedly had been telling you over the last three months that the Russians had to take control over the city of Mariupol because it is, it is a strategic point. Not only it is an important port, but it is a port city, but it is also an important point or land corridor which connects the Russian populated areas in East Ukraine, Donetsk and Lugansk with the Crimean Peninsula. So it was obvious that the Russians sooner or later would take it. Also, as you know, during that war, Mariupol was completely besieged by the Russian uh, 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 Federation military forces as well as the local Russian Resi- local Russian residence forces from Donetsk. So the city was completely beleaguered by the Russian forces. There was no way that even a humanitarian aid would reach Mariupol without Russians allowing it. There was no way to, as Ukrainians call it, defend the city because, because the, after the street fights, all of those Azov battalion soldiers were basically pushed into that uh, steel plant, steel factory, Azovstal, where they were blockaded or blocked, completely sealed off, so they cannot even, you know, they cannot even leave that area because the Russians are all over the place. So the smartest thing that they should have done, could have done, would have done, would be to just lay down their arms and surrender and then, you know, be released later and be treated according to the international law. But no, since they've since they rejected the repeated calls by the Russians to lay down their arms, now the Russians will have no mercy, obviously. They will just, you know, continue to attack that plant until the last Azov battalion soldier has been exterminated. One of my friends sent me a, a photo from Russia. It is detailed from a Russian supermarket. <laughs> it was the department for the baby food, you know, baby, baby food. And uh, the shelves are completely full and you know this is under the toughest sanctions ever imposed on Russia the shelves are completely full uh, in that part of the supermarket and he told me this is just one part of the supermarket the other parts I'm not going to I haven't taken photos but the shelves are full with all the things that people need so you see the sanctions against Russia are not really giving all those results even on the financial front because last week uh, last week, the Russian currency Rublya, Rublya was the strongest in the na- in the last two years. Strongest currency just you know uh, got stronger against both euro and dollar. So those sanctions have not given exactly the results that the um, the uh, Ukrainians and others in the West wanted. Uh, of course, there are certain repercussions. You know, that can be felt in the Russian economy, but not as severe as the West thought. The West thought that Russia would be brought down to its knees and would beg for mercy. Well, that did not happen. Uh, today, Ukrainians have also stopped uh, uh, distributing gas through one of the pipelines 
because that very pipeline, that very uh, uh, gas line goes through the uh, area of Lugansk, which is populated mostly by the ethnic Russians. So the Ukrainian government said that it just shut off its supply of gas supply through that through that uh, pipeline because it is no longer under the Ukrainian control. Instead, they'll be trying to find some alternative. The European Union is now having meetings these days trying to impose, as they call it, the sixth package of sanctions against Russia. This sixth package does imply, or does involve, uh, to ban, ban Russian gas import completely. <laughs> How is that going to be reflected on the European economy? We don't really know, because, you know, they do depend on the Russian gas and so on, so... It just remains to be seen. But however, you know, so much madness has been going on all over the world. Plus the tennis association of tennis players, they decided to exclude the Russians and, Belo and, and Belarusians from the, uh, from the competition, which is totally stupid. What does the, what does the sport has to do with the, uh, with, with politics and war? But dear friends, the world has gone completely crazy. In any case, it has been it has been seventy seven days of this conflict in Ukraine. Ukrainians claim that again to give you the summary that around the city of Kharkov they regained certain uh, control over certain cities and villages or smaller towns and villages. The Russians continue to push the Ukrainian central government forces out of Lugansk and Donetsk. They are severely attacking them. Uh, the Kherson area has requested to, the local authorities reported, it has requested to join Russian Federation. In the city of Mariupol, the uh, steel plant has come under heavy Russian attack, in which they're trying to eliminate the last soldiers who remain there, the last soldiers who belong to the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. The Russian currency ruble, Rubla has uh, been stronger uh, has reached its peak in the last two in the last two years against both euro and dollar and what is going to be the end of all of this when the peace negotiations may start we don't really know but anyway i think that you will appreciate uh this update as well i haven't really given you any update for a long time because i was waiting to accumulate all kinds of news and besides i was hoping that i would be able to report to you that there has been a ceasefire and that peace negotiations will start shortly. However, I cannot report that good news to you yet, but this much I wanted to give you for this installment. My name is Alexander Sashavelic. I am the manager of the Hope of Israel Library, private library, uh, and I'm also a preacher of the biblical history, uh, and I am part of a nation, of a nation, that receives both news from both sides, both Ukrainian and Russian side. So I think that that can provide you at least more balance for you than what you have been served through the Western media outlets.